Good to see all of you this morning. In the way of announcements, y'all don't forget, next Saturday, before you go to bed, set your clocks ahead. One hour, so that you'll be on time for church next Sunday. Also notice in there that we are beginning our monthly fellowship events again. And so our first event will be an Italian night on Tuesday, March 21st at 6. So we're excited about getting these going again and look forward to that. As we begin our worship this morning, let's open with hymn number 55 in our hymnals here. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and set it at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father,
dele. Do you have any special prayer requests this morning? The family of Bobby Williams and the family of B.J. Mullins. Any unspoken needs, just lift your hands. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, as we come to you in this hour, as we gather as your people, as your church, we gather, Lord, with joy in our hearts. Joy for the beauty of this day. Joy for the blessings of life. But most of all, Father, joy at the knowledge that you love us. Truly love us. And we give you honor and praise for the love you have showered upon us through the gift of your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, as we remember your promise never to leave us, it brings us great comfort. It brings us courage and strength to live into each moment as your people. We pray that we truly embrace your promise this morning, that where two or more gather in your name, you would be in our midst. And so, Jesus, we welcome you among us and pray that your spirit would fill us and guide us, would empower us to truly embrace your word this morning in such a way that it fills us and begins to mold us and shape us more perfectly into the disciples you have called us to be. And Lord, we are humbled when we consider that we can come to you with everything, no matter how great the need, no matter how small the concern, no matter how wonderful the joy that we experience, all, Lord Jesus, we share with you. And we give thanks for answered prayer. We give thanks for those who have received healing and guidance. And we continue to lift before you those, Lord, who are sick and ask healing for their bodies. We pray for these families that we have lifted before you this morning and for all who grieve that through your Holy Spirit's presence, they would find comfort and hope at the great love that you pour into their hearts and lives. And Lord, we pray that as we continue to worship you now in this space, that you would receive from us our praise as we continue to lift our voices in song and as we lift our hearts to worship you. We also lift before you the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray as we say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Our second hymn this morning is Oh, Sometimes the Shadows Are Deep. 245 in our hymnals here. If you're able, I invite you to stand as we sing. <laughs> Oh. 
O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou discernest my thoughts from afar. Thou searchest out my path and my lying down. And art acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue. Lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou dost beset me behind and before. And layest thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Whither shall I go from your spirit? Or whither shall I free from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, let only darkness cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to thee, the night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with thee. How precious to me are thy thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. If the ushers will come forward at this time, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings. Father, as we come now bearing our tithes and our gifts, may we be ever mindful of the richness of your blessings toward us. And so we pray, Lord, that you would receive these that we offer this morning and that you would bless us as well and send us forth from this place, Lord, revived and empowered to share your word of hope, of love, and salvation through Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
The gospel lesson this morning is from the third chapter of John. Beginning with verse 13 and reading through verse 21. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been wrought in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Please be seated. Y'all have to excuse me grinning every once in a while, because when she turns around and sees me, she smiles so much, she about spits her nook out. So. <laughs> John 3.16 is unequivocally the most well-known passage of Scripture in the New Testament. And in fact, in the entire Bible, there may be only one other passage just as familiar. Care to guess which it is? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The very first words of the Old Testament. That was the beginning of all things that exist that we know. The sum total of our collective human experience began in that instance. And God, after seeing all that he had created at the end of the sixth day, said it was good. God created a good world full of good things. And into that Creation, he also placed man, another new creation. And he said, men was good. Everything was good. But it was not to remain the good creation of God's hand because sin entered the world. When Satan tempted Eve to eat that forbidden fruit and she took it and ate it and turned and handed it to Adam and he willingly ate it. In that act of intentional disobedience and defiance of God's only restriction that he had placed on them, they broke faith with God and sinned in their prideful disobedience. And as the penalty for that sin, the ground which was their source of food was cursed so that thistles and nettles and weeds and poisonous things now grew and man must now toil to gain a crop. Our farmers wouldn't know anything about all those weeds and problems and hardships, would you? Women were cursed with pain in childbirth. And both men and women from that time would begin to age and would die. Death, the ultimate penalty for sin. A terrible price to pay And the world rocked along with more and more disobedience toward God. People rebelled against the edicts of their creator and were stricken with disease, with pestilence. They learned to hate and to war against one another in order to gain property or riches or power. They murdered one another. They learned to be cruel and selfish and filled with vain pride until God had enough and regretted having 
placed humans in his creation and was prepared to wash the evil from the earth and be done with it. But God is a just God and there was one who was faithful. There was one who still worshiped God and he and his sons and their wives would be spared. But sin did not disappear when the waters receded from the great flood. And although Noah and his family would, would exit the ark and begin a new life, offering sacrifices to God and praising him, it would not be long before temptation reared its head again and the hearts of people were filled with selfish pride and disobedience. So God made a covenant with another faithful man named Abram and promised that he would become a father of nations if he would remain faithful to God, and he did. So that covenant God made with him extended to his descendants who became the nation of Israel. And he made covenant with them, a covenant called the law, and gave them means by which to atone from the penalty of their sins. But still the people grew further and further away from God. They couldn't keep his commandments. They continually turned their back on it to follow their own ways murdering the prophets God sent to warn them and call them to repentance. And that cycle of disobedience, falling into idolatry, being punished and repenting, then restoration and everything going good again, only to start being dis disobedient and falling in. This cycle was repeated for generation after generation until finally God determined there was only one thing he could do in order to reach out and offer humans the chance to come and be reconciled to him. He would send his only son to live here among us as one of us. He would be born in the humblest of beginnings and would teach people how to truly love God and how to love one another. And then when he had shared everything necessary for them to understand how to discern the will of God he would offer himself as the one perfect sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Not just an atonement for the penalty, but atonement even from the guilt of sin. So that we could live in joy and in peace, we who will believe. This is how God would bridge that enormous chasm between himself and his creation that had been caused by sin. And in our scripture reading this morning, we see Jesus offering this teaching to Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He had come to Jesus by night to try and understand all of these teachings that Jesus was giving, these teachings that were so shocking and so revolutionary. And it all came down to that explanation. The one that we, that we grasp so firmly and know by heart. What does all of this mean? How did it all happen? What is God doing? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves the world. He loves all of his creation. And it's a love that doesn't require anything else. It's a love with no strings attached. He doesn't love us because we deserve to be loved. He doesn't love us because he gets some reward from loving us. God just loves us. That's all. No reason. He just loves you. He loves me. No matter who you are, no matter how you've lived your life up to this point, no matter how great your sins are, God loves you. Right now, in this very instant, and if you believe it, that love becomes yours. We embrace it. 
and eternal life is ours. Believe it and you will be born again with a new kind of life that triumphs over the sin of this world. It triumphs over the temptations of this world. It even triumphs over death and brings us to eternal life. It's a love that when we have believed it and embraced it, fills us with such grace and peace that it leaves us in speechless awe. We can only take that love and, and share it. That's the greatest desire of our heart is we've got to share this. with so You need to know how much God loves us. That promise came as a shock to Nicodemus. And it comes as a shock to so many people today too because so many labor under this misunderstanding that God is just biding his time until that last little grain drains out of his cosmic hourglass and he sends the angel to destroy the world and give us all what we deserve. I hear preachers preach that way. That's not the gospel. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, for them, the New Testament isn't a book of good news. It's a book of judgment and fear. They love focusing on revelation. Try to explain all the symbolism there, which can't be done. For them, the New Testament serves to show just how imperfect we are and how deserving we are of God's punishment. That we just don't understand that kind of love that God has for us. And because we're so surprised by a love that we don't deserve, we often refuse to believe that it's real. We often can't put our full faith in that love and in the God who loves us so much. Fred Craddock is one of the greatest preachers and, and teachers of our age. And he tells a story of his father who spent years of his life hiding from God who was trying to seek him out. And he wrote, when the pastor used to come from my mother's church to call on him, my father would say, you don't care about me. I know how churches are. You want another pledge, another name, right? Another name, another pledge. Isn't that the whole point of the church? Get another name. Get another pledge. My nervous mother would run to the kitchen crying for fear that someone's feelings would be hurt. When we had an evangelistic campaign, the pastor would bring the evangelist, introduce him to, our, to my father, and then say, seek him, get him. But my father would always say the same thing. You don't care about me. Another name, another pledge, another name, another pledge. I know about churches. I guess I heard it a thousand times. But one time, he didn't say it. He was at the Veterans Hospital. He was down to 74 pounds. They had taken out his throat, put a metal tube in, and said, Mr. Craddock, you should have come earlier. But the cancer is very far advanced. We'll give radium, but we just don't know. I went in to see him. In every window, potted plants and flowers. Everywhere there was a place to set them, potted plants and flowers. Even in that thing that swings out over your bed, they put food on. There was a big flower. And by his bed, a stack of cards 15 inches deep. I looked at the little cards sprinkled in the flowers. I read the cards beside his bed. And I want to tell you, every card, every blossom, every potted plant was from groups, Sunday school classes, women's groups, youth groups, a men's Bible class, all of my mother's church, every one of them. My father saw me reading them. He couldn't speak, but he took a Kleenex box and wrote something on the side from Shakespeare's Hamlet. He wrote, in this harsh world, draw your breath in pain to tell my story. I said, what is your story, Daddy? And he wrote, 
I was wrong. I was wrong. What a terrible thing to say that's the story of my life. But you see, it's not until you know that God is seeking you in love, not in condemnation. It's not until that moment that the gospel really becomes good news for you. We love John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. We can quote that from heart. But what about John 3, 17? Can you quote that one to me? Because it explains why Jesus gave us John 3.16. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For, you know what for means? It means because. Why did he do this? Why does God so love him? Why did he send his son? Because he sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You hear that? He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already. Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus didn't sin, uh, was not sent into the world to condemn us. He didn't come to condemn anyone. God did not send Jesus with a word of judgment. He sent him with a word of hope, of promise, of love, and of salvation. That's why he sent his only Son. To save us. And we as Christians are tasked with taking this gospel and preaching it to all creatures. And look, let's face it, some of those creatures are rude. Some of them are downright ugly and hateful and obnoxious. And we are tempted sometimes to shout judgment at them. But we can't do that. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If Jesus didn't condemn the world, we certainly cannot condemn the world because that's not God's message. That is not the Bible's message and that is not to be our message. Our goal is to be vessels that are filled with Christ's love and his compassion and sharing that gospel of hope with the ones who are unrighteous. Listen, church, your ministry isn't to the saved. Do you hear that? My ministry is to the saved. My responsibility as a pastor is to equip you, equip those who are saved and who believe to go out and do ministry to the unsaved. Your calling is to go preach the gospel to the ones who don't believe. It's to the ones who are unrighteous. It's to the ones who seem to be hopeless. That's who we're reaching out to. Judgment will come, but that's not my message. That's not your message, church. Our message is that God loves you so much that he sent his own son to die in your place on that cross so that you can be saved. Jesus came as the light for all people. And he said, those who believe love the light and they come to the light. We want to be bathed in that light and then take and share that light into a world filled with darkness. But those who refuse to believe flee from the light. They run into deeper darkness. But we go after them. We keep loving. We keep witnessing. We keep sharing. We keep testifying. And they see that what we do is done through God. We don't take credit for it. Jesus said, he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been wrought in God. 
It's God working in us and through us. And it's God who we glorify through all of this. We have to resist the temptation to make it look what I've done. Look at my deeds. See how good a Christian I have been. And make sure they know that it is Christ in me. It is God's love in me that is doing this and is causing me to love people that others say are unlovable. Paul described it by saying, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Because the darkness is gone and his presence brings light and hope. And that new life of faith has been wrought in God. And we have to learn to trust him. We've got to embrace that love enough to trust God fully. Not just his promises, but his timing as well. Don't give up because God never gives up on you. There was a man who was shipwrecked and marooned on an island. He had gathered a few things that had washed up on the shore and managed to build him a little hut out of driftwood to get out of the sun during the day. He scanned the horizon day after day. He prayed every morning. He prayed every evening for God to send a ship to rescue him. But none came. And one day he went out scavenging for food and came back to find that the little fire he had built had gotten away and had caught his little hut on fire and that driftwood was burning like crazy. Smoke billowed up into the skies. He watched all his provisions that he had put in there and saved burned up with it. And he had nothing left. And he fell to his knees crying and said, God, why? Why would you do this to me? Why would you let this happen to me? I don't understand. And he cut some palm fronds and crawled under them to get out of the sun and and lay there and, and fell asleep. And when he woke the next morning, it was to a sound that he had not heard in many weeks. Not, in fact, since he had been marooned. It was the sound of an engine and a ship that had come and sent a boat to the shore. And they came and rescued him, and he was dumbfounded. And he was thankful. And he praised God. And he asked the men in the boat, how did you know where to find me? And they said, oh, we saw your smoke signal. What he counted as tragedy was God's method of salvation. Trust his love, trust his promise, trust his timing. As Jesus told Nicodemus, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other ways, God acts on our behalf in ways that are beyond our comprehension, even beyond our imagination. <clears throat> even though we like to think we're in control, thankfully, we really aren't. All this has happened for us, and all this has happened in us because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. And we will celebrate that love in a moment wrapped up in these elements of Holy Communion. I hope you know that God loves you and that you will take that love and share it with others. Our closing hymn is 369, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Oh
unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.